Good morning. Before we jump in the lesson, a few things. Number one, you're going to want to be here tonight as we finish up our series on baptism with Wes McAdams. He and I will be having a conversation to wrap everything up, so you'll want to be here for that at 5 o'clock. Uh, secondly, preacher training camp, one of the best weeks of the year, uh, is coming up. The deadline is May the 1st, so if you haven't signed up, young guys, 14 to uh, 18, make sure that you do so. Uh, we'd love to have you. We've got some spots left open, and, uh, but they fill up quick, so be sure to sign up for that. And the third thing is attendance. Man, the last few weeks, we have been bulging at the seams, and that's good. Close to 800 folks last week, I think 790-something, so uh, between the two services, that's good. But we want you to know that we want to know you. So as you come through and make your way through our congregation, let us stop and meet you and greet you. Let us give you a warm hug. I see some familiar faces out there and some new ones this morning. I try to get around to everybody, not always able to do so, but I'd love to meet you and get to know you a little bit better, and so would all of us. And we also want you to know that the, the crowds are nice, but our goal is to feed you and grow you. And so I hope that uh, you'll allow us to do that and, and give us an opportunity to do that. Um, Many years ago, when Houston Nutt was head football coach of the Arkansas Razorbacks, he would bring in freshmen and he would sit down and talk to them. And one of the things that he would talk to them about is the uniqueness of being a Razorback. You guys knew I'd throw in an Arkansas Razorbacks illustration, right? So he'd tell them, there's a lot of lions, there's a lot of tigers, there's a lot of bears, there's only one Razorback. You get to be a Razorback and there's only one of those. But then... He would look them in the eye, and he would ask them three questions. Number one, can I trust you? Number two, are you committed? And number three, do you care? Now, these simple, profound questions were asked for obvious reasons. Number one, I, I can't go into battle with you if I, I, I can't trust you, right? If, I, if you're not committed, I, I, can't, I can't go with you onto the field and, 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 and spend all this time working with you and, and, and helping you get to, to a point where you can help this team. And if you don't care about your team, if you're too selfish, then that's a problem. But these things extended beyond the field and had to do with the classroom and your behavior off the field. Can I trust you? Can I trust you to go to class and not get in trouble? Can I trust you to be committed to keeping your grades up so you can stay eligible? Do you care? Do you care about this team? Do you care about what we're trying to accomplish? Or are you just going to be selfish? Pretty pointed questions for high caliber athletes that have been the superstar in their own schools. And I can't help but make an application. I think you probably know where I'm going with this. But imagine God sitting you down, looking you in the eye, and asking you these questions. Can I trust you? You know, we trust in God, and we should, rightfully so. Can God trust you? I mean, we expect a lot from God. Can God expect a lot from you? Is an investment in you by God a safe investment? Can he trust you? Are you committed? You know, we often view commitment as church attendance, right? Being faithful and coming to church every time the doors are open. But the Bible uses words like discipleship, bond slave, bond servant to showcase what it means to be totally and completely committed. Are you committed? Are you committed to following Jesus wherever following may go, even if following may lead up a hill and onto a cross? And do you care? Well, of course you do. You wouldn't be here if you didn't care, right? But caring has more to do with just studying the Bible and praying. It has to do with caring for the widows and orphans in distress, feeding the hungry, giving the thirsty something to drink, clothing the naked. Do you care about people? Tough questions for sure. But what does all of this have to do with restoration? Well, in short, everything. Because a restored individual is trusting, they're all in, and they care immensely. Remember a few weeks ago when we talked about David in relation to repentance? Remember his contract prayer in Psalm 51? In part, it reads like this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. In essence, David says, fix me, God. 
I'm broken. I need to be put back together. Have you ever said that to God? I know I have. Maybe some of us need to start saying that to God. Fix me, God. Put me back together. You know, we, we give David a hard time because of his enormous sin here, but let's give him some credit, too, because he does own it. He points the finger directly at himself, and then he turns to the only one who can help him get well. That, of course, being God. Many of you, especially ladies, know who Chip and Joanna Gaines is. Maybe you visited their empire in Waco, Texas. If you know anything about Chip and Joanna Gaines, you know they started with a show on one of those girly channels, what, HGTV, right? Fixer Upper. God is David's Fixer Upper, and he's our Fixer Upper as well. David trusted in God for restoration. He knew that if restoration was going to happen, that it would only come from God. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. David says, David had lost his spiritual mojo, and that's what sin does. It robs us of our joy. It robs us of our salvation. David was desperate to get it back, and he was ready to return to his commitment. That same trust and commitment he had when he went into battle against the giant was the same trust and commitment he wanted to get back that he had lost when he got slayed by the giant of sin. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Take me back in, David says. Like all of us at some point, David's commitment had waned and it had cost him. Summer before my junior year in high school, my parents got divorced. My dad sat me down. I was 16 and said, I want you to stay here. Take care of your mother. I'm going to leave. You can come visit me anytime, but I can't stay here. First time I ever saw my dad cry, and really the only time I think I've ever seen him cry. My head just wasn't right. I couldn't see engaging in two-a-day practices and all that, so I quit. I quit football. Didn't tell Coach why, I just told him I quit. But then I went to a game that year, and I was surprised how much I missed it, and I I wanted back in. And so as soon as the season was over, I went to Coach Shelby, and I said, Coach, can I come back? And he looked me in the eye, and he asked me two questions. Can I trust you? And are you committed? He wanted to make sure that I wouldn't walk out on him again. Now, of course, he didn't know the story, and I never told him. But he wanted to know if I was going to be all in. I think that's what God wants to know as well. I mean, I think all of us at times find ourselves standing in the, in, in the bleachers instead of getting into the game. We find it easy to just stand on the sidelines and spectate instead of getting involved and participate. David wanted back in the game. He wanted to renew the commitment that he had once had because he knew that the best place to be was on God's team and competing for him. And finally, we see that David definitely cares. Teach, let, then I will teach transgressors your ways, he says, and sinners will be converted to you. David was ready to get back to work. Kind of like a, a former alcoholic who, who wants to be a counselor to help others that have gone through what he has gone through. Converted sinners make the best preachers, right? David wanted back in the game, and he wanted to help others overcome what he had tried to overcome. I've said it before, but the Bible is a book of failures, isn't it? It's a book of failures. And to me, that is one of the reasons why we can say that it's inspired. Because if anyone were just writing this narrative, they wouldn't include all the bad stuff, right? You gloss over all the failures, and there's some bad ones. You'd only highlight the positives, But that's not what God does. It's not what the Holy Spirit does. Scripture is about failure. Over and over again we see it. And we see God use failures to accomplish His good will. If the Bible is going to tell the story of redemption, renewal, and restoration, it's got to tell the story of rejection, ruin, and regret. Because all of us have our moments, like David, of heroism and hedonism, don't we? We all have those moments where we slay the giant, and we've all had our moments where we've gotten slain by the giant. But you have to include the heroism and the hedonism in order for it to be balanced, because that's the truth of our nature. So how did we get here? Well, I think you know, but let's rehearse it. Genesis chapter 2, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, And let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. Now, I think we're all pretty familiar with this image of God phraseology. We've talked about it over the last few weeks. But what exactly does it mean? Well, the the word image in Hebrew is the word salim. And it can be translated as idol or statue. Now, an idol, of course, is a visual representation of an invisible God. So in the ancient world, a statue would be placed in the temple of that certain God so that when you went into worship, you had a visual representation of the invisible God that you were paying homage to. In a sense, we are God's statues. We are visible representations of of an invisible God. So you picture the cosmos, you picture all of the earth as God's temple, and here we stand as visual representations, statues of his creation. Now in the Greek, as we've talked about before, image is icon. And that word sounds familiar because we use the word icon. And an icon is a visual representation of of an invisible God. So when God said, let us make man in our image, he is saying, let us make him like us. Let us make him to look like us. The goal was for us to be a mirror. So we were made to be acons, and that word in the Greek involves two main concepts, representation and manifestation. Paul said, just as we have become the, uh, just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. So the idea is that the icon is that representation derived from a prototype. So we are the prototype of the original. We look like Adam, but we were made in the image of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are that visual representation and that manifestation. God created us individually to look like Him. Now, there's still more. When we see the Hebrew phrase, image of God, that phrase is Salem Elohim. This phrase was used throughout the ancient Near East as a reference to a king. For instance, Pharaoh was called Amon Re, or image of Re, Re being the sun god. And all over Mesopotamia, kings were referred to as the image of God. The king was a visual representation of the people. He was viewed as semi-divine, and he was also viewed as that God's representative. It was thought that he had some special relationship with the God, whichever one it was, that the people did not have. He was the Salem Elohim. The implication, of course, is that if the king is the image of God, the Salem Elohim, then the rest of the people are not. And that's what makes the imagery of Genesis so beautiful and so interesting. It claims that all human beings, not just those of royal bloodline, but all human beings are made in the image of God. But there's more, right? And the more involves two people, a serpent, and a tree. Every Sunday morning. I stop at Stripes to get my coffee before I come to work. I know that a small cup of coffee costs $1.61, so I always have correct change. The other morning I walk in, the lady at the cash register who is very sweet, very kind, she keys it in. I know it's $1.61, but on her screen there, it says (laughs) $1,161. Now, If this were Starbucks, I would understand. That's about how much a small cup of coffee costs at Starbucks. So I give her $1.61, hoping she would catch it. And sure enough, when she goes to push the button to open the drawer, she realizes what she had done. We all had a, a good laugh about it. Somebody that didn't laugh about a miscalculation was this guy by the name of George Bean. He's from Palmdale, California. And he pulled up to the drive through at a Burger King to pay for his order. The total was $4.33. And he hands the lady his debit card, and she punches it in. And she made a mistake, and she doesn't clear it out before she punches in the numbers again. Well, at the end of it all, he owed $4,333 for that meal. And the bad thing was, she ran the card. He never checked the receipt. 
He was charged $4,333, finally realized when he looked at his bank account, he was only had like a penny in there, and the local newspaper got a hold of the story, and they read it with the headline, The Most Expensive Meal in History. And folks, let me tell you something. That's not true. There is a meal that's far more expensive. The most expensive meal in history is the one that we read about in Genesis chapter 3. Two people paid more than they ever wanted to pay. In fact, it left them bankrupt. These people ate the wrong food from the wrong menu. Wasn't even the best food that was offered. Yet they partook of it anyway. And the Salim Elohim became distorted in the Garden of Eden. That's where it all started. Mankind failed to represent and manifest the image of God, and we have been paying the price ever since. We live with the consequences of this fallen world and this sin forever, at least until Jesus comes. But there's still more. There's a rest of the story. And the rest of the story involves restoration. Now, Let me tell you, my my dad is from Brinkley, Arkansas. If you don't know where Brinkley, Arkansas is, it's halfway between Little Rock and Memphis on I-40. And just 10 miles up the road is a little town of 600 people called Cotton Plant. My dad just recently bought a mansion in Cotton Plant, Arkansas for $18,000. Now this mansion, as you can see, see, is pretty stately. It's also kind of dilapidated. It's a project for sure. And he goes on the weekends and he works on this mansion. I don't know what he's going to do with it when he's done. But he's done a lot of work to it. You can see on the inside uh, what he's done with the floors. Hopefully you can see that. But he's really, he's restoring everything. He's really only had to replace a little bit because this thing is so well built. The craftsmanship's unbelievable. There's, you know, this uh, uh, cypress floor joists and studs. There's this white pine on the floors that doesn't have a knot in it. This whole thing was built in 1912, the year the Titanic sunk. It was built without the use of a power tool, not one power tool. Can you imagine sawing all those boards? I mean, that'd be crazy, wouldn't it? He said if this, this house were built today, it'd be worth around $400,000. And he is restoring it, trying to bring it back to its original beauty, which is exactly what God's trying to do. God is trying to restore his creation to its original beauty. Look with me at 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I want you to notice what is written beginning in verse 12. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So this is at the dedication of the newly constructed temple. And Solomon prays to God, asking him to forgive the people of Israel. And what does God do? He provides them with a recipe for restoration. Did you notice that? The same recipe that we use today. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek God's face. And turn from your wicked ways. That's the recipe. First of all, I must recognize my nothingness without God. I must realize I am nothing without God. That's what it means to humble myself. Then I pray. I pray in humble prayer, asking him to forgive my sin. Then I must get closer. That's what it means to seek God's face. I draw near to God. As James said, draw near to God, he draw near to you. So I draw closer to God so that I can move further away from sin. And then I have to repent, turn from my wicked ways, seek closer communion with God, because the closer I get to the divine, the more I see that I cannot stand, and so I change my posture, and he changes my life. Now, of course, this is a process, right? This is an ongoing process. Restoration is vital to the Christian's identity because the finished product takes time. Our lives constantly involve patching and and mending and maybe even a complete overhaul at times because we are a construction project. 
Every one of us are a construction project. Yes, we have been baptized. Yes, we're a new creature in Christ. Yes, we have been redeemed. But as we all know, becoming a Christian doesn't inoculate us against Satan and the virus of sin. Baptism is not a vaccination against transgression. Getting back to the original, just like restoring a home, takes time and energy and effort. And there is a cost involved as well. On 8384... At the opening, the entrance of my subdivision, they're building a new overpass. And I'm sure it's going to be great when it's done. But it's a mess right now. I don't even go that way. I don't think I could tell you how far along they are because I haven't gone that way in months. I just take Iberus, go to 707, and I come into town that way. Because it's messy. There's delays. Sometimes you can't get under the, the overpass they're constructing so that you can get to the other side. Sometimes they've got that blocked and, and you have to go way around just to get to, you know, onto the highway. Construction zones are places that are noisy. They're disruptive. They're places where you have delays, at least slowdowns and bumps and all those kind of things. I can imagine, though, for the project manager, it might be a beautiful place because they know what it's going to be. They can see the bigger picture. They know that at the end, this is going to be something worthwhile. It's going to help tremendously with traffic flow and all those things. We are God's fixer-upper. Even though we're a mess right now, He sees something beautiful because He sees the finished project. Even though we can't, He does. I think about the book of Joel. We've talked about Joel in the past, and if you remember us, taking on that study, we looked at how the opening of Joel is calamity. The book of Joel starts with calamity. Locusts have utterly destroyed the land, and not only is the land devastated, the people are devastated as well. Nothing like this has happened before. It's an unprecedented event, and we know that because one of the first lines is, has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? And this is where Joel comes onto the scene, and he sounds the alarm. You see, Joel is God's prophet who acts as an alarm clock. He is a warning to the people. He is not going to waste this catastrophe. He is going to use this to bring the people hopefully back into compliance. He is also announcing that what these people are going through is a precursor to something even bigger in the future. When those who have done well will be blessed and those who have it will be cursed, the day of the Lord is coming. Blessing for those who loved God, cursing for those who opposed God. So the locusts were a preview of what God was capable of and what was to come to those who didn't repent. But there is a lesson in here for us as well, and it's this, that God is not finished with His people. The story is to be continued. God still had a plan for His people. He is going to turn away the locusts, and He's going to restore what they had lost. Look at chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. It says, I will restore to you... The years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You know, money can be restored. Property can be restored. Broken down cars and old homes can be restored. But the one thing that can never be restored is time. It's fleeting. And once it is gone, it is gone. And you can't get it back. The people of God had endured some lost years. And these were known as locust years. The locusts had taken that away. They had so many lost years. And it was their fault. I mean, they had no one to blame but themselves. It it was all self-inflicted. Yet, though God's people paid a terrible price, though there was no one to blame but themselves, God was still playing fixer-upper. He had a plan to restore what had been lost. And I want to ask you, how many of you had wasted years before you came to Christ? Maybe, Maybe you didn't. Maybe you grew up in the church, 10, 11, 12 years old, you you got baptized, you've been faithful ever since, that's a success story for sure. But there are many others who wasted many years before they became a child of God. I was a good kid for the most part. 
made decent grades, did what I was supposed to, but I had kind of this Jekyll Hyde personality. And I could blame it on, you know, my parents and that divorce and all that. I'm not going to do that because it was all me. I had this stage in my life where I decided that, you know, I wanted to do some things that maybe my parents wouldn't approve of. And so I acted rebelliously in a, in a lot of different ways. I hung out with people I shouldn't. I did things with those people that I shouldn't. And then my wife came along, and she helped to settle that down a little bit. But I can't say that I turned around immediately. Even after we got married, I still engaged in some of those things. Even after I became a Christian, I didn't amputate all those things like I should. Those were wasted years, in my opinion. I think about all those years that I wasted, all those years that the locusts took. I could have been a Christian much sooner in life. I could have been living this life a lot sooner. I maybe could have been a minister a lot sooner in life. Yet I spent so much time wasting time doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. However, once I became a child of God, all that didn't matter, right? All the joy that I had wasted, I got back. All the hope that I'd lacked, I got back. All those wasted years didn't matter anymore. Now I was a child of God. Now I'm moving forward. Now circumstances are different. And there's a principle that speaks to all of us in the book of Joel. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. I wanted so badly to make amends. I wanted so badly to to make up for all those wasted years. But God took those years that were stripped and devoured by the locusts and he redeemed them. And he does for you too. He redeems the wasted years. To the repentant sinner, God says, I will remove your shame and your regret and your guilt. In Christ, all is made new, even the calendar, right? God goes back to the days of the locusts. And he restores those wasted years. Because from the moment you are cleansed of your sins, all those blessings you missed out on are yours. All that joy you forfeited is yours. All that you lacked, all that peace that was absent, you get. All that hope you desperately searched for is yours. All those years the locusts destroyed are restored. And we can stand upright today as if we have never sinned, as if we had lost no time, as if we are right where we should have been before the devourer came along and took it from us. God puts us back on his divine schedule so that nothing has been lost and we are restored. So, I want to ask you this morning, have you lived way too many lost years? And is it time to do something about it? Because I come in contact with so many people who can't get past their past. They reflect on those wasted years, those years that the locusts took, and they don't see any hope for restoration. My friends, nothing could be further from the truth. The entire Bible is a story of hope and redemption and restoration. God is building something. He wants to build something in your life. He wants to make something completely new. Are you going to let him? See, here's the deal. Our God is a fixer-upper. So let him get to work. If we can help you this morning, David's going to lead us in a song. We invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.